Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to all of you. My name is Alexander Darkun, and I'm the Associate Director of Prentice Institute for Global Population and Economy at the University of Lethbridge. I will be the moderator for today's uh, panel discussion. The, this panel event is co-sponsored <coughs> by the Southern Alberta Council of Policy Analysis, SACPA. We have, in the past, uh, co-sponsored with them, and we are glad that we are co-sponsoring again with them. And thank you very much, uh, SACPA. Um, the concept for this evening's panel discussion is that many of the most challenging issues we face are of global nature. However, the solutions often falls on nations to address. These global problems are sometimes termed as wicked problems, or even mostly more wicked or super wicked problems. This is not because these problems are evil, but it's because these problems are really very difficult to address and even, even more difficult to get our heads around them. So what we are doing this evening is to bring together a panel where each panelist would focus on these issues thinking globally and thinking national uh, uh, challenges and bring their own research to bear on at least attempting to generate meaningful discussion on these issues. So today we have four topics to discuss related to these big global issues. We have border issues to discuss. We have trade issues to discuss. We have people flow issues to discuss and climate changes issues. So the panel event this evening is seen as a, a collective engagement opportunity that brings people doing research in these areas together with the public, like you and I, to at least bring our head together and discuss these issues. So this evening, I will briefly introduce our four panelists who are here with us to discuss these issues. All of them here are faculty at the University of Lethbridge, and they are also affiliates with the Prentice Institute. Our first speaker would be Julie Young, who is an assistant professor of geography in the University of Lethbridge and also a tier two Canada research, a Canada research chair, a tier two Canada research chair in critical border studies. And then next to him is Pascal Gazalian who is also a faculty member at the Economics Department in the University of Lethbridge, who mostly does his research on trade issues. And then next to him is uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Kamu Islam, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the, uh, the uh, Prentice Institute. And then, the fourth person is Celeste Banz, who is a PhD candidate in geography in the University of Ludwig. So you can see that we have panelists from various uh, departments uh, bordering on the issues that we'll be discussing. Also, we have gender balance. LAUGHTER <laughs> And also from different career or at different stages of their career. So we have, we have a good set of brains to help us discuss these issues. However, 
because this issue is really uh, very important to us and we want to have enough time to engage in useful discussion between the panelists and us, we will be giving them only 12 minutes per presentation, please. I'm sorry, but we need to discuss it much more further. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think it is only in good time and fair that Julie starts giving us a presentation. So Julie. to be under. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yes? yes? Okay, great. Thank you, Alex, and thank you to the Prentice Institute and to SACPA for organizing this evening and inviting me to be part of it. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are living, working, and studying on Blackfoot land and would like to give recognition to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future. But moreover, I want to insist on this as a central question that we should be considering tonight, given that nation state borders, like those of Canada, wrote over lands, relationships, and communities that preceded them and continue to erase and ignore them. Sorry, I just realized I didn't start my slideshow here. There we go. So these relationships are consequential. They matter to all of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. And so in the context of a discussion on the national and the global, and particularly when we're thinking about trade and refugees and migration and climate change and borders, it's crucial to acknowledge this colonial past, but also in particular, the ongoing colonial present, right? Because there are other nations beyond this nation state that matter, right? So a question that we must engage with is whose sovereignties are taken seriously and whose are ignored, right? And which borders matter? So I wanted to put that out here right off the, the bat just so that we have that in mind as we're working through all of these questions. Now, the problem that I've been asked to engage with is the issue of borders. And at first, I had a hard time wrapping my brain around how to think about the global and national relationships between them. But I'm a geographer, so I'm always thinking about the different scales of various issues. So I would argue that we think about borders at the national scale. We think about them as national projects. But really, their impacts stretch far beyond the territory of one nation state. And in fact, almost by definition, they tie the territories of at least two nation states together. So at the same time that global disparities in wealth, opportunity, safety, and security exist, they confront or come up against the presumed unquestionability of nation state sovereignty to control access to their territory and to control mobility across their borders. Right? And global processes, the, in particular the globalization of the economy, has widened this gap in economic security in particular. Right? And so since citizenship and rights are, and the rights and responsibilities that accompany citizenship are assigned at the national level, it can create a lot of pressure on borders, right? Because a lot of people are trying to move to places that provide them with more opportunity, more security, and more safety. And so a political theorist named Joseph Karens has compared the, the structure of the citizenship system to the feudal system in the sense that where you are born and sort of the accident of your birth really has a great bearing on your life chances, right? And so that's a really important element of the sort of tying of citizenship and rights to the nation state that's really important. Mm -hmm. and, and in thinking about why people may want to be crossing borders or maybe push to, to cross borders. Now, for a time in the 1990s, there was a lot of discussion about the end of the nation state, right? The idea that under the forces and structures of globalization, that nation states were becoming less important, 
right? And that they would be weakened to the point of disappearing as a form of political organization, right? That borders would disappear and we would come to be living in a borderless world. And yet since the fall of the Berlin Wall in November of 1989, there's been a significant buildup of nation state borders. And in fact, some people would argue that nation states, especially in terms of border control policies, have become even more important or have tried to really strengthen their sense of sovereignty. Right? So countries invest ever more resources in fortifying and policing their boundary lines because border control policies, in the words of a legal theorist named Catherine Dovern, who's based at UBC, says that border control policies, so controls on the movements of goods and people, are the last bastion of national sovereignty in a global age. So that one of the last places where the nation state form is actu actually still has a lot of power to direct the flow of what are understood as more global forces. Right? And as such, the border control policies are an ever-growing preoccupation of national politicians and policymakers, right? As you can see in this photo op from February of 2011, when the prime minister and the minister of immigration staged a photo op on a boat that had the previous year brought a number of people claiming refugee status to Canada. Right, so we've seen evidence of this quite recently, the ways in which national border control policies try to push back at global processes through the Canadian government's response to these irregular, or some people would call them illegal, border crossings um, that became publicized starting in January 2017. And the ways in which all three major political parties in Canada have been staking out their positions over how Canada's border should work, as we can see in this recent mailer from our member of parliament, Rachel Harder. Right, so border control policies are a key site for the expression of national sovereignty, right? pushing back at global flows of people, as well as for struggles over ideas of national identity, ideas of justice, security, safety. Right, and so, but I would just put a note of caution here in this issue, right, because I think this might be something that might come up in the discussion, that the focus in the coverage of this situation at the Canada-US border over the past two years has emphasized a sense of crisis, right? And certainly the numbers in certain periods have been higher than usual. But a reliance on the notion of crisis suggests that this, these were unanticipated movements and that it's just a short-term blip and that really people don't move around the world that much. And it sort of authorizes or invites a kind of erasure or sort of ignoring of the longer histories and the wider global contexts at play in why people decide to move and why they cross borders in the ways that they do. So now at the same time that nation states have been investing in the security of borders at the edges of their territories, they're also becoming increasingly creative in their border control efforts to prevent or deter unwanted migration. Right, so borders have actually become much more mobile over time. They cross borders not only in their effects, but also in, in where people actually encounter them. Right, so in other words, border control policies not only affect people in places outside of Canada, but increasingly countries like Canada have implemented their borders in a range of spaces that are actually outside of the territory of Canada. Right, so we could perhaps think of borders as becoming increasingly globalized. Right? So for example, we can think about the imposition of visa policies, um, which means that you can actually encounter the Canadian border at a visa office in Guatemala City or Beirut or Nairobi and be denied entry into Canada without ever actually setting foot on Canadian territory. Right, so Canada's borders actually appear in, in quite far-flung places that we don't often think about. The border is not just that line between Canada and the US. And indeed, you may have seen these dramatic images over the weekend from the Mexico-Guatemala border, which is another area where I do some research. And it, it's really crucial to keep in mind that that border is not just about Mexico and Guatemala. Right? It's also in particular about the United States, 
but also about Canada, which is something that we really conveniently try to ignore. But since 2009 in particular, Canada has been in making large investments of resources and personnel and equipment, along with the US that's doing it at a much larger scale, to really push Mexico to enforce that southern border in particular ways, right? So to make Mexico enforce Canada's and the US's borders for them, right? To try to stop people at that border before they reach Canada's border. Right? So we need to be asking ourselves, where is the Canadian border? Right? And to think about, in all of these different contexts, the other places that are implicated in how these borders work. Right? So I would argue that this bridge over the Suchiate River between Mexico and Guatemala is actually a site where we see the Canadian border at work because of the investments that Canada has made in pushing Mexico to enforce its border in a much more robust way. So I'll conclude uh, by encouraging us to take a step back uh, and to think about what's really going on at the Mexico-Guatemala and other borders as not just affecting the two nations that are divided by that border, but also nations that are further away. Right? So to think about the global relationships, the transnational relationships between different borders. Right? Because nation state policies focus on securing borders to promote trade and prosperity right? and to limit unwanted forms of migration, even as vast economic disparities contribute to displacement and are crucial to understanding the movement of people both globally and locally. Now, more economically developed states continue to fortify their borders in the face of overwhelming evidence that such policies endanger people on the move, right, and encourage human smuggling and trafficking, as well as increasing the quote unquote burden on less wealthy nations that actually host the majority of the world's refugees, right? Most people can't make it to Canada. Canada is really protected by geography. And so if these policies don't stop people from moving, it's time to question their effectiveness given the mounting costs and the mounting investments that states are making in policing their borders in particular ways that are pushing people literally to death, right, as they attempt to cross borders. So I'll close with this question, and I would like us to really think about who bears responsibility for the impacts of border control policies when states like Canada are increasingly putting their borders on the move, right? Their borders are becoming increasingly globalized and transnational. And that's something that we need to engage with as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. <laughs> so our next, our next speaker is uh, Pastor Gazillian on trade. Good evening, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, so today, uh, the, um, we're gonna talk about thinking globally and thinking nationally. And when uh, we read thinking globally and thinking nationally, two terms could come up, globalization and protectionism. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about globalization and protectionism. Okay, so what is the definition of globalization? There are different definitions, but one of them is the integration of national economies through trade, investment, capital flow, labor migration, and technology. So as such, globalization is characterized by increases in trade in goods and services. So this is one obvious uh, element increases in international capital flows, and these increases are associated with the activities of multinational enterprises and foreign direct investment that is commonly undertaken by multinational enterprises, increases in migration, diffusion of technology, information, and ideas, and decreases 
and communication and formation and transportation costs. Now, uh, the, uh, the discussion around this factor is, is big, but I'm going to just uh, try to al associate globalization with economic growth through trade. So uh, globalization, as we mentioned in the previous slide, is associated with increases in international trade. Now, the question is, well, how international trade or increases international trade could lead to economic growth? How? Well, there are different avenues, and some of them are listed here. One avenue is uh, increases in international trade would lead to, uh, well, specialization leads to gains from trade. Trade promotes scale economies, which is disproportionate uh, uh, decrease in cost associated with large scale of production. Trade increases competition. So when we open up borders for trade, competition increases. And uh, there are several studies that found that outward looking exporting trade countries have macroeconomic stability. They have low inflation and stable exchange rates. And uh, lastly, export earnings allow importation of advanced technology. So all these factors eventually will lead to, uh, to, would promote economic growth. Now in this globalized world, there is a prevalence of what's called regional trade blocks, such as, I mean, a couple of good examples, the European Union and the North American Free Trade Agreement, which became the US uh, MCA. Uh, recently. So what about regional trade uh, blocks? In this uh, regional trade blocks, each member nation can import from another member nation freely or at least cheaply with lower, say, tariffs, while maintaining trade barriers against imports coming from non-member or outside, non-member countries or outsiders. Here are a couple of examples, uh, European Union and uh, the U US M MCA. I'm trying to get used to it, so. <laughs> okay, so look, here, here, look over time, global export ha increased significantly. You can see in the first graph here, global exports increased significantly over time. But what also increased is the number of trade agreements. So this second graph here show, uh, shows us the number of uh, trade agreements that are reported to the World Trade Organization. So, uh, so now I, I will show you one, a more recent uh, a figure here. So you see as uh, of 2018, there were 285 regional trade agreements that were reported to the WTO. So it continues to increase. What are the benefits of these regional trading blocks? Well, uh, the first obvious uh, benefit is it creates trade between member countries. So more trade between member countries. And there could be political cooperation and eventually job creation, perhaps. But there are some drawbacks because regional trade agreements divert or perhaps decreases trade from between non-member countries and member countries. So more trade between member countries as, and less trade between non-member countries and member countries. And it could lead to a loss of sovereignty. I mean, so this... Now... Another aspect of globalization is foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment is prominent in this globalized world. It is an investment that is made by a firm, multinational enterprises, or individual in one country into business interests located in another country. So I'm going to show you one example of, uh, one little example of foreign direct investment. You see, this, this, here we have two countries, say home country and a foreign country, and this one is a firm, okay, a firm here. 
So as you see, this firm is producing and selling products in the home country and exporting to the foreign country. Now, if this enterprise decides to undertake foreign direct investment abroad, so it can build a plant in the foreign country. So we have now two plants, one plant in the home country and another serving home market and another plant in the foreign country serving foreign market. So in this case, as you see, this firm, this enterprise undertook foreign direct investment in the foreign country. Okay, And we can think about uh, foreign direct investment in this case perhaps as a trade barriers jumping strategy because by building plant abroad we kind of jumped the trade barriers and uh, by doing that so okay so the second thing uh, the second uh, thing I would like to talk about is protectionism protectionism uh, currently we're hearing this word kind of frequently, protectionism. What is protectionism? Protectionism is the trade measures, for instance, trade barriers, such as tariffs, quotas, or economic policies imposed by countries' governments to protect their domestic businesses and industries from foreign competition. At least this is the argument. Here, this map sh uh, shows us uh, the protectionist measures taken since 2008. And as you see, many developed countries have significant number of protectionist measures uh, compared to developing countries. There are a few exceptions, such as Argentina and Brazil, and India, perhaps. Now, what are the common arguments for protectionism? There are several arguments, and many politicians use these arguments. Uh, so what, why uh, trade protectionism occurs? The first argument, protecting jobs and industries. So without protectionism, the argument uh, says, without protectionism, for instance, a nation could lose long-established industries and companies. So we need protectionist policies. The second argument, protecting consumers. Uh, the argument could state that it is essential to protect consumers from unsafe imported products. Another argument, particularly for some developed countries, national security it is critical to have national manufacturing of defense items protected from foreign competition for a nation's existence. And uh, the fourth argument is called the infant industry argument. So uh, new manufacturers have an extremely difficult time competing against well-established foreign companies. So what we need to do in this case? Well, the government must intervene through protectionist policies to help new manufacturers to gain market share and to attain economies of scale. So sometimes these, these uh, protectionist policies are temporary until uh, the domestic industry uh, gains some uh, advantage and uh, realize uh, economies of scale. Now, what are the disadvantages of protectionism? Well, uh, obviously, consumers uh, uh, will end up paying more with protectionism, and they have limited choice of goods and services with protectionism. Protectionism, in many cases, can cause retaliatory reactions from other nations. And I think we're hearing a lot uh, about this in the news. Uh, protectionism reduces market competition. And when market, market competition decreases, there will be a reduction in the incentives to innovate. When market competition is high, ins the incentives to innovate is high. Uh, but when market competition is low, firms may become lazy. So, 
Uh, now, as you see, there are pros and uh, cons, but uh, in overall, uh, there is sufficient uh, empirical evidence uh, that uh, tell us that globalization and uh, opening up markets is uh, welfare increasing. So, so with that, I will. Uh, yeah, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. Our next uh, discuss, um, panelist is uh, Dr. Islam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am very happy to be here to speak about uh, about an urgent issue that we are facing now. And also, uh, I am very happy because of giving this presentation in front of such a great audience. So, uh, I am uh, saying that uh, this is urgent issue because uh, you know now this is the world that we have seen frequent humanitarian catastrophe. We have seen the frequent uh, disruption of climate change, migration issues, so many things we have seen what is happening in Syria, Venezuela, people are moving. Recently we have seen last two days from Honduras and Guatemala and Trump is trying to push them back. So this thing is, has become a global issue. But although it is global, the, it is national in the sense that the government or the states, they have to bear the burden of large number of uh, refugees that they come. Uh, my home country, uh, Bangladesh, actually facing or experiencing the same problem uh, that, that I want to mention very briefly in here. But uh, before that, let me start with a story. Uh, Aklima Khatun, this is her real name. Uh, she wants to tell her real name instead of in using pseudonym because she wants to know others what happened to their lives. Uh, military uh, came to our village in a helicopter. They entered in our house. I had three sons and two girls, two daughters. They killed all my three sons. They raped my girls, killed my husband. Somehow I was able to escape. They burned down my house. This is the real story and not the single one. This is the story of thousands of uh, Rohingya refugees in Myanmar. And why, why this is happening? Uh, let me, I just want to give a brief uh, overview of historical background and how many of them came to uh, Bangladesh and what, what, what are the impacts that it has on, uh, in, in the case of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, me. Uh, this you can see the uh, Rohingya villages in Myanmar are burning. Uh, the other side from Bangladesh, you can, uh, this is the uh, Bangladesh, this side, Myanmar on the other side and the red part. Uh, what happened is uh, uh, Rohingya ethnic community, they lived in Myanmar for centuries. They, they lived in peace for many years, but once Myanmar won independence from Britain, Myanmar introduced the new uh, Citizenship Act in which they did not include uh, Rohingya refugees at, as ethnic indigenous groups to Myanmar. So due to this law, citizenship law, uh, Rohingya refugees, uh, they were actually excluded to become a uh, citizen of Myanmar. So what happened, For they do not have any status in their country and for decades they have faced repression from the military. They, are, uh, they have faced extreme discrimination in all aspects of their life. They have uh, all aspects of their human rights were frequently uh, violated and recently what has happened is recently uh, Myanmar army 
carried out a large scale atrocities against, against the Myanmar uh, refugees. And due to these uh, large scale atrocities, what happens is thousands of people they escape to Bangladesh. How many of them escaped to Bangladesh? There were se uh, several waves of atrocities, but recently uh, it, it has been estimated by the United Nations that 700,000 Rohingya refugees fled to Bangladesh, bringing with them the extreme stories of violence, burned villages, murder and rape. And it was estimated that uh, 25,000 uh, uh, of them were murdered and more than 18,000 women were raped. The uh, Antonio uh, Guterres of the United Nations uh, mentioned that it is a systematic violation of human rights. And, uh, and uh, Rohingya people are the most discriminated people in the world. Another comment from the Jaid al, uh, Jaid, Jaid Rad al Hassan from uh, United Nations Human Rights Commission, uh, he mentioned that uh, it clearly seems an, a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Now, this statistics, but this has been happening last few years. Now, according to the statistics of the uh, government of Bangladesh, there are more than one million, uh, one million refugees. They have come to Bangladesh, more than one million. So this number of refugees, just think about how, what kind of impact it has. I want to mention few aspects. The first, accommodation issue. Then food. Then we have education issue, security. Regarding accommodation, providing accommodation to one million refugees, it is challenging for Bangladesh particularly. It should be mentioned that uh, the land area of Bangladesh is just one-fourth of Alberta, Alberta province, one-fourth. And it has a population of 162 million population. So accommodation is a big issue in there. They live in the camps. I can show you a picture that uh, they live uh, Just it. I have a picture in the camps. These are they are very vulnerable to flood, cyclones, and other issues. So there are also issues about food. We need large number, huge amount of food for this one million population. These are the issues that Bangladesh is facing. Then. The most important issue is education. Thousands of children in this, uh, among these refugees, they do not have access to formal education. United Nations estimated that about 300 children, their future is in danger, in, in, is bleak, and they do not have any access to uh, formal education. The another thing is that law and order situation is also a big issue. The crime rate in the region is going up. Human trafficking has become a you know important issue because it has been a chief source of you know girls, women, and other issues for trafficking. Uh, there are also environmental impact. Six thousand acres of uh, forest has been uh, restored for arranging accommodation for one million population, and one hundred tons of fuel woods are burnt every day to cook for them. One hundred tons of fuel woods. So these are a few of the many environmental impacts. So why, uh, why this is happening is this is happening because the states, they do not provide adequate attention to the internal uh, conflicts. So what I am uh, thinking, arguing is that to solve these issue, issues, this, this has a wide range of impacts. So we need to think uh, globally so that we can address these is issues. Particularly in the region, China, India, Russia, they can play crucial role, and other uh, international organizations, World Bank, IMF, they spend huge amount of money. So they can attest strings to their aid that governments, they will not be allowed, or they cannot, or they should not kill their own people. 
this has to be ensured. So, this kind of frame, framework uh, can be introduced. So, uh, these are just uh, one of the few uh, opinions, but uh, we, we want to hear from you all. Your opinion is important. So, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, our, our last speaker will be Celeste Bay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Celeste, and I'm going to be talking to you about um, thinking globally and thinking nationally related to um, climate change issues and dis uh, discuss a few examples relating to my research. So um, if we start looking at, at climate uh, from a global perspective, climate is, is a very complex and there are very complex uh, patterns that happen at a global scale. So for example, uh, you might have heard of um, a system where we have a really, really warm uh, year and it's an El Nino year, okay? So it's very warm and dry or else, uh, geez, this summer was really, really cold and rainy. Well, it's a La Nina year. So it's a global system that uh, changes uh, over time. Some of these um, global systems, there's, so that's just one example. There's um, you know, many types of, of systems like this that operate at a global level. And um, some have very short uh, cycles, some have longer cycles that go to decade scales. And uh, one of the challenges now is that these global systems are are changing with a warming climate. So when I'm going to talk about climate change, I'm kind of talking more about um, just a warming climate and what the impacts are going to have on some of the weather that we're having. Okay. Uh, another thing that um, happens with um, warming a uh, warming global climate is we end up having uh, an impact on the oceans. Okay, and so water will hold heat a lot more than, so it takes a lot of energy to heat water up, but once water is warm, it takes a longer time for the water to cool down compared to something like land. So if you've gone, to, gone outside on a hot summer day and you step on your concrete, or sorry, your asphalt uh, pavement with your bare feet, it gets pretty hot really quick, right? And so that's kind of what we're talking about with, um, with the um, holding the water. Um, and as ocean temp, so I'm going to focus on the ocean temperature. So as ocean, oh, sorry. Uh, so as, can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, so as um, the ocean temperatures are getting warmer, now, one of the other things that are happening is, is it's causing sea levels to rise. And so we have uh, melting ice in the Arctic, in Greenland, in Antarctic, um, and we've also got um, melting from, coast, uh, for gla from glaciers that are um, on, on the land. So one of my research interests is looking at... at um, hurricanes, okay, so you can um, see here, um, I'm looking at hurricanes and the, um, the impact from a warming climate. So this image here is actually taken from last year's hurricane season, and uh, it shows three hurricanes that are in the, in the Atlantic. So I'm, I'm hoping you can see my mouse here. So here is Mexico. Here's Florida, okay, and so we had one hurricane here, Hurricane uh, Katia, Hurricane Irma is kind of in the center, and then over here, Hurricane Jose was coming, uh, coming through. Now this is very unusual to have three hurricanes happening at the same time. Um, now I'm just focusing in the Caribbean here, but um, if you hear the words typhoons, those are hurricanes that happen over in Asia. Okay, and 
Uh, these hurricanes, they're very, very large storm systems. So I'm just going to take my mouse here and kind of um, show you. So what happens is, is they move in a circular fashion plus they move in a forward fashion. So they generate a lot of wind, okay, and a lot of rain. And so that's what makes these, these systems uh, very dangerous. Okay. So a few weeks later, there was another hurricane that came through. So what this is showing you here is this is showing you the path that this hurricane here, Hurricane Maria, took um, last summer. And it went past Puerto Rico, up along the eastern coast of the US, and then over into the Atlantic. And way over here, it actually hit France and um, the, the British Isles and caused a little bit of, of damage over there. Now this here, hurricane here is just a little bit bigger. And um, when it hit Puerto Rico, the national energy grid was totally destroyed. Okay, so these powerful winds, um, they will knock down infrastructure, like they'll knock down the power lines and the, and, and the power grids and things like that. And uh, as you can also see, uh, maybe it's hard to see, but this hurricane was actually larger than the other three that had gone through two weeks earlier, okay? And this hurricane was the costliest hurricane in Puerto Rico's history, okay? So now with warming ocean temperatures, um, there's more fuel to, uh, in, in these, uh, to provide for these hurricanes. And so then they can grow larger and stronger than they normally would if, the, if they didn't have the extra heat from, from the warming oceans. So this uh, hurricane here uh, is Hurricane Sa uh, Sandy. And it was dubbed Superstorm Sandy because you can just see how big this hurricane got. So there's Florida there. And, you know, like we're looking all the way up the east coast, like, I mean, this, this hurricane was absolutely massive, okay? And if you take a look at this path here, it kind of started in the center of the, the Caribbean, and it went past Jamaica, Cuba, the Bahamas, and it kept on, on starting to head out towards um, the, the northeast, which is a typical type of track. But the problem is, is that... Um, what happened in the, uh, in the summer of 2012 was it was an uh, unusually warm um, summer, and so the Arctic was warmer than it normally would have been. And so what ended up happening is there was this other storm system that was um, just um, off of Canada's coast, and it prevented this hurricane from continuing on. So it diverted over top and to the New Jersey shore and went into the Great Lakes and into Ontario, okay? And so um, it, uh, it was uh, quite devastating. So what I just kind of want to point out here is this is New York. So you can look at the coast here. So this, you know, and New Jersey is, you know, you just keep kind of going south. But there's a lot of people that are living on coastal areas. So now, as the sea levels are rising, and then you get more intense hurricanes, you've got a fair number of people that are starting to become uh, in danger. And um, so what's happening is not all countries are prepared for these hurricanes. So this Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, that hit the New Jersey Shore, that was not expected, and people were not prepared for it. Um, there are some countries uh, in the Caribbean that uh, are more uh, prepared for these things, and they've got evacuation plans because they have to try and get people out to safety. And, oops, sorry. And so what ends up happening is when these hurricanes come through with those high winds and a lot of rain, um, they end up uh, flooding and destroying places. So this is actually where Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, ended up going off the New Jersey shore. And you can see here's a road and, um, you know, completely underwater. This 
image here is a bridge that totally got destroyed. Um, this here, actually this one is from in the Philippines, uh, but you can see just the power of these hurricanes with the, uh, the big tankers that are, have been pushed up onto the shore. And um, so what's, what's happening is, is we've got these big, big global weather systems that are impacting nations. And the problem is, is that recovery is down at a nation level. So some countries um, don't have the resources to be able to go and um, get uh, their infrastructure rebuilt. So Puerto Rico, for example, uh, three months and there was still, you know, power grid that's, that's kind of offline. Um, and so they're dependent on foreign aid and things like that to deal with a global issue. So I, um, go, I'm going to just wrap up now and uh, kind of just uh, put it to you that we've got these, these big global systems that nations have to deal with on their, on their own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celeste. Um, indeed, from the discussions by our four panelists, have, have shown that uh, mo most of the issues they touched on are of global nature, and the, the best way to deal with such issues would be to also uh, confront them globally, because we are all in this together. However, if you listen very carefully to almost all the uh, presentations, uh, though we are concerned with global issues and how it must be dealt with instead of being uh, left to be addressed at a national level, we also saw that there are national issues that become global. From the trade side, for instance, if a, if a large nation like United States starts looking too much inward and applying so much tariffs and protection against uh, import from other nations like China, Canada, and Europe, it, it, could, it could draw us all into recession, as it has happened before in the past. So there are some times that national uh, issues also become global issues. And also with the first presenter's issue of the nation, many people fleeing their nation to other nations, it's a global issue but caused by national policies and uh, uh, national problems because these people feel they, 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 don't, they, they are not safe or comfortable economically or socialized in their own nation and are now trying to uh, get themselves out of the situation to other nations. So as, as we go into discussion on these issues, uh, I would like us to look at it from the two sides of the equation where global issues must be addressed globally. Also, we have to also be aware that national issues could create uh, global problems. And when it becomes that, it is only fair that we face it on the global front. But before we go in, into our discussion, I would like to take this opportunity to advertise two of our brown bag discussions that we have at the University of Ledwidge. Uh, the next one, which is uh, this coming Friday, is by our first presenter. And I think if you come there, you will get much more insight to what she talked about today, because she had only 15 minutes there. We sort of give her one hour to go in depth, and then we can have more discussion. So she will be talking on uh, reframing the crisis mode of governance at the Canada-US border. And the next one is by another Prentice uh, affiliate, and he is presenting on an evolving geography of income inequality, a study on Calgary as a three-city approach. So please, uh, we have a mic at the back there. So if you feel like what you want to amplify 
your questions for us to hear you clearly, you could go there and ask questions. So please, let's begin the discussion. Thank you very much for a great presentation.